But we'll, we'll, we'll have some fun. Well, I'm sure we will. I hope so. That'd be nice. I should also probably say that, you know, I forgot that uh, Jeff Carroll is speaking the same time as you, so. Oh, really? Okay. So we'll see what ends up happening in this sense. I was speaking with uh, someone else who was doing uh, a caregiving session during the same time as HD Buzz. And I was like, listen, yeah. people will come, they'll learn, they'll understand. But yeah, I think this is, luckily this is recorded. So for those that can't make it, they can see the recording of it. Well, we've got four lovely people so far. Yeah, wonder, yeah. Oh, here we go, here's a few. Yeah, they, they, they'll slowly come in. All you have to say is access to effective drugs. And they say, what? Yep. Yeah. Let's, let's make it happen. I hope so. I hope so. We've got a few in anyway. Hey, Matt, I heard you told... Uh, hey. I, I heard you... Uh, you might have said it was at 10 and someone thought it was 10 a.m. <laughs> I did originally. Uh, uh, thank you, Hugh, for coming back for... Uh, part two for us we appreciate it it's okay and it's match of the day after this <laughs> oh my goodness i haven't got the energy sorry that's the uh, that's the soccer soccer highlights program so <laughs> uh pan someone asked does our audio work uh it no, should so, work. well oh well for us not for them i think oh, that's I what see. You meant. so if anyone has questions for this um, all you have to do is put it in the chat feature or the Q and A, which is right below. Um, so that's that's the best way to ask ask your questions. But you know, this is going to be, from from my opinion, it's going to be very, um, very important. Hold on, well, there are only four of us. Oh no, there's more than four of you. There's there's that's more. Like no seventeen. Worries. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, this, this will be an important uh, discussion talking about, you know, access to effective drugs, especially when we think about research and the where things are going to go. Um, you know, for me, coming from a family impacted by HD, I'm very excited, but I also, you know, have those questions of how to afford it and how to get access to these treatments um, to make sure that I can, you know, use it and take it one day. So, sure. Sure. This is the final session of the day, though, and I'm going to, as, as you said, Hugh or Professor Hugh, <laughs> you'll be talking about e equal access to new HD treatments coming through, and we do appreciate you for not just doing this session, but doing an earlier session today. It is um, hugely appreciated. So, you know, we'll, sp we'll share some time at the end for some Q&A but I'm going to stop talking, just pass it on over to you to get the conversation going regarding okay. access to effective treatments. Fabulous, Seth, I've got some slides to show. So cool. Seth, thanks for inviting me. So I'm just gonna share my screen, hopefully in a second. Uh, share, here we go. Does that work, Seth? Yep, Can you're you good. That? That's fine. So I'm just gonna make you small in the corner. And then I'm just going to talk to my, oh, a little bit bigger than that. Oh, there you go. So I'm just going to uh, talk to my slides. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, when I was last at the EHDN, which is in Vienna, um, gosh, that's about two and a half years ago, I think, um, I heard everybody talking about the new drugs coming along and lots of scientists getting very excited about it. And I've started to get worried about the fact that when drugs get licensed, you know, are we going to be able to get hold of them? So this is why I invented this project called the Heated Project about a year and a half ago. We had our first meeting about a year ago, just before the lockdown. And the acronym stands for Huntington's Equal Access to Effective Drugs. And like all good campaigns, we have a slogan. So our slogan is, what do we want? We want equal access to effective drugs against HD for anyone who would benefit from them. When do we want it? We want it. As soon as any effective drugs are licensed by the appropriate bodies, it's not a very catchy political slogan, but that's a, we're, we're maybe, it's a work in progress. So 
um, that's what the campaign is about. It's about identifying barriers before drugs get licensed so we can start overcoming them right now. And this, you know, you're going to come into this really as uh, people from HD families and young people who need to get involved. So here's the question. How do we make effective drugs and get them to people? So it's a big long line. So there's people working in labs, first of all, testing things on mice, and then after a while, testing things on these little primates, one kind or another, and then first in human trials, and that the, the first one, the, the Ionis product, that was published in New England Journal of Medicine in May 2019. And then as many of you know, the first in the line of the disease modifying therapies is in phase three now. And that's going to report, I think, early 2022, maybe mid-2022. But then there's a bunch of other treatments coming behind that. And you think, OK, you get to phase three. That's fantastic. I'll just get my laser, print, laser pointer out there. So you get to phase three, you think, OK, that's great. And then as soon as that, if a drug does well at phase three, then everybody can have it, can't they? No, they can't. There's a few other small steps to go. So first of all, I put European Medicines Agency, but well, that's also in the US, that'd be the FDA, and there are probably other ones in other places. So it's got to get licensed by those people. And that's not all either. Somebody's got to pay for it. So somebody's got to foot the bill, and that's health insurance companies and states and other organizations that might pay for it. And we also, if it's an intrathecal treatment into the spinal fluid, we've got to somehow expand our capacity to give it, because at the moment we don't have a very high capacity to give these treatments in the world. So there's a few space, a few steps after this phase three trial that I'm gonna just go through briefly. And then of course, when you've done all those things, then um, you can give the drugs to people and everybody's happy. Okay, so that's the, these are the steps. And at the moment, the first of the disease modifying therapies is about this step here. And people are talking about these steps to start with. Um, okay, that's the pathway. So um, I put the European Medicines Agency as the uh, licensing body. In the States, that would be the FDA, and there may be others around. And they've got a fairly low bar for um, approving and licensing medicines. They really want to know, is it safe? And does it work? It doesn't necessarily have to work amazingly or be curative. It has to work a bit. And is it OK for it to be prescribed for patients? Are there any dangers or worries? So you can see that the licensing bodies have a fairly low bar for licensing things. However, there's more to getting drugs than them just being licensed. Unless you're a billionaire, in which case, if once they're licensed, you can have them if you pay for them. But somebody's, they won't be cheap, so somebody's got to pay for them. So someone's got to pay the bill, whether that's a health insurance company and people through their premiums or governments and people through their taxes. And there's where these two lovely things come in, quality adjusted life years and disability adjusted life years. We're not going to talk about these today. We're just really talk about quality adjusted life years. I just thought I'd just give you a quick briefing on that. So that means it's really a way of saying if this drug helps you to live longer and during that time you have a greater quality of life, you want a metric that reflects both living a bit longer and having a better quality of life in the meantime. Um, and that's what the idea of a quality is, a quality adjusted life year. Here's an example of it in HIV. And so this is the yellow bar here is like people without treatment and then people with um, antiretroviral therapy. You can see they're living longer and during that time they have a, long, a better quality of life. And I guess you can say these, this could be turned into a number if you like this gained qualities and people say well how much are you going to pay per quality adjusted life year. Now at the moment in the UK the standard rate for a quality adjusted life year is about £30,000. Um, or that's what the uh, UK government would normally pay for a quality adjusted life year, uh, which actually isn't very much, uh, especially when you think about these new treatments. That's just to give you an idea of how it goes. So how do we calculate it? We really basically look, how much does a quality of adjusted life year cost? So you take the cost of the new treatment, take away the cost of the old treatment, given that the, you have the idea that you're going to stop the old treatment, you look at your new quality of life and you subtract your old quality of life and you put one on top of the other and it's a simple equation. What could be more simple than that? Um, well, of course, these two factors, C for cost and Q for quality of life, 
you know, there, there's a lot of discrepancy in how they might be measured. And at the moment, neither of those are measured well in Huntington's disease. So if we talk about cost first, first of all, it's almost impossible to know the cost of drugs. I'm thinking about, you know, the, the first drug in the line, which is the, the Roche project, which is intrafecal. I've no idea what this is going to cost, but I, that hasn't stopped me from giving a guess. So I'm going to guess how much it costs per person per year. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to do something else first. I'm going to talk about quality of life before we talk about cost. Let's talk about, sorry, got my slides the wrong way around. We're going to talk about quality of life first. Measuring quality of life is really hard. And um, everybody's got a different idea about what, about what manifests itself as quality. So these are some nice British chocolates called Quality Street. And um, everybody's somebody's favorite. That's what they say. And it's very subjective what quality means. And it's like that in quality of life measurement. And at the moment in Europe, and I think to a certain extent in the States, um, we use this little fella here called the EQ5D, which is the European quality of life five item. I don't know what the D stands for. So somebody comes into clinic and we give them this little questionnaire and say, fill this in and uh, before you take the drug and then fill it in afterwards. And then we can work out the difference, uh, hoping that it's improved. I think you can all see that this is a pretty blunt instrument and also some items like pain and discomfort aren't that relevant for Huntington's disease. And it doesn't really capture, if you like, early problems or subtle problems at all. But at the moment, this is the, this is the form that is a standard for all diseases. And so this is going to be used in Huntington's disease uh, by most of the deciding bodies already. And it's not a really good scale and it's not really fit for purpose. Uh, and nobody does a lot of research on it because our research community are really molecular biologists on the whole. They're not rating scaleologists. And that's a failing. I think we failed you in that respect. The scientific community have failed you in that respect because we don't have good rating scaleologists in our community, or not many, a few. Ah, coming on to the costs now. I don't know how much this uh, first drug in the line, the Roche drug, is going to cost. Uh, but that doesn't stop me um, having a bit of a guess. This is what I was going to say before, but I got my slides the wrong way around. This is what we would say, a back of a fag packet guess, or back of a cigarette packet guess. You just do a little like, I don't know, add a few things together. So I thought about the Roche intrathecal drug, and this is my guess about how much it costs. Now, I know there's someone from Roche on the call. I think she's heard this before, um, but I'm still going to guess, and I'll explain why I guess. This is what I think it's going to cost roughly per person. Quite a lot of euros. See yeah, how accurate my calculations are. Um, but there's a wide range in you know, what that might be. It might be as much as that, or it might be as little as that. So there's a, lot, a lot, large range in my guessing. And like all good things, I've got a, a rider beneath it as well, which is basically, this is a complete guess based on what's charged for other drugs like Spinraza in similar countries, and the cost of you know pipelines and research and development and shareholders and also the fact that we just don't know how well the treatment works yet so i guess if it works really really well it'll be at the higher end of this and if it works not that well it'll be at the lower end and also that uh people like me are just not party to these sorts of discussions ever at all they're usually held behind closed doors so in the absence of that i guess people like me are going to make guesses so what does that amount of money really look like in real terms? So this is an English primary school per person. It's about that much of an English primary school budget. So, you know, not, or if you want to get a bit more political, this is a Tomahawk cruise missile. And it's about that much of a Tomahawk cruise missile for one person, if you assume that my pricing is about right. Uh, of course, I might have got it completely wrong, but it's a ballpark, I think. It won't be far off. Okay, but when you're thinking about costs, it's not just the cost of the drug. And within prothecal drugs, for instance, you've got to consider the people who are going to give it, the nurses and the bed and you know, the equipment and stuff. So it might add a bit more to the cost. But there are also costs that might be offset. For instance, if you could delay someone going into a nursing home or increase the time that they were more economically productive or less time collecting state benefits, and also, as we, you'll be very familiar with what I would call opportunity costs for children. So that is, you know, if you could delay mum or dad getting ill for a few years in time that you wouldn't have to take time off school or university 
to help them out and that could be a huge cost. So I guess in the health economics terms, there are quite a few things on this side of the seesaw that I've always thought about. And I think we have to campaign a bit to get those really understood and included in uh, people's calculations because not all bodies and paying bodies will look at this bit. They'll probably just look at this bit. So I think we've got to encourage them to look at this bit because in Huntington's disease, that could make a big difference. So then if we're thinking about intrathecal therapy, um, which is the first in line, if you like, it might not be always the thing because there's small molecules coming along too. Um, if people just turn up at a hospital at a neurology department, how easy it is it just to get intrathecal therapy? Well, if the answer is not very easy at the moment, that would have to be quite a big shift. So a colleague of mine did a survey of ultra specialist HD centers and neurology centers, and the vast majority wouldn't be able to cope with the demand that would come from the licensing of a product. And this was presented at the European Academy of Neurology last year. So there's got to be a big change in that. It's happening a little bit already because they're having to give intrathecal drugs for spinal muscular atrophy, and that's started to change things a bit, but there's a long way to go. And in order to know about capacity, you've got to know how many people have HD. So I thought I'd ask you all a question. How common is HD? So what I want you to do is it's a bit of homework for you to make sure you're still awake. Put your answer in the chat, how common you think, or the Q&A, or is there a chat as well, Seth? I think there's a little chat, isn't there? Yeah, there's a chat. Um, are, are you asking for how common HE around the world? I'm yeah, assuming. well, anywhere where you are, or how just how common do you think HD is? Like, per how many people per 100,000 population have HD in general? Have a little think about it. Okay, have we had, did we have any answers yet? Yeah, we have one in 10,000, 285 okay. people in okay. NI with 1.8 million pop, 10 okay. out of 100,000. Oh, lovely. Right. Okay. That's fabulous. 10 um, out of, yeah. I mean, so every, everybody got some, everybody's got some good guesses. Um, and let's see what I have. Oh, hang on. Let's get back on here. So I guess if we went to textbooks, it might say 10 per 100,000, something like that. That's one per 10,000. But then, um, if you, it depends how you define HD, really. If you define it in this way, which I think is relevant for this particular, for HDO, for instance, people who carry HD in expansion, whose brains have already changed in some sort of way as a result of HD pathology and could therefore benefit from treatment, I think that's going to look more like about, rather than 10 per 100,000, more like about 80 per 100,000. And so that changes the capacity argument completely. So how common is HD is a really important question to get your head around because that affects how many people we think might be lining up for this treatment at some point or other that could benefit from it and that we need to be planning for. So I did a workout of my area, my region, which is about 4 million people. And I reckon if we define Huntington's my way, um, then we're looking at somewhere between three and 10 intrathecal treatments per working day for a region of 4 million people. So that's probably two full-time beds in a hospital. And that's not a cheap thing. That's a lot for a population of 4 million. So that's something to think about. Okay, so with all of these things, it feels like, um, it made me think of this. This is a picture of the Boxing Day tsunami in the Indian Ocean in, I think it was 2011. And, um, I felt for a while like I was this person here, pointing at the tsunami, looking, saying, look, this stuff is coming. Um, these drugs are coming and we're not well equipped to think about how we're gonna pay for them and how we're gonna give them. And like, while I was doing that, I felt like there was a lot of people that were sort of running away from it. And one or two people like this person here who were just wandering on by and not really looking at it. Um, but I think now as we learn from other diseases like spinal muscular atrophy, that now is the time for us to engage with this process. Like how do we measure quality of life? Who's gonna pay? Who's the decision maker? How are we gonna deliver these treatments? They're, they're great problems to have, uh, but we've got to start looking at them now. So I say, I feel like that person there, but I feel like now it's changing and there's more people engaging in this debate. So, uh, this is a, a pamphlet from a um, 
a, a guy called Lenin. He was in Russia at some point or other. And I, this little thing says, I think in Russian, I'm not a Russian person, that says something like sto delat, which means what is to be done. So it was, it was this call about what is to be done. This is my call to you. What is to be done? What do we need to do as a community? Um, well, I guess we've got to start engaging with decision makers and engaging with people who are going to be making decisions about paying for and providing drugs as they come through. And we've got to get involved in all of these issues because all of these issues affect whether or not we will get access to drugs as they get licensed. Um, and so we've got to start building our relationships. And that means you have to be doing that too, I think, because your voices need to be heard loud and clear because as a, as a patient and uh, family community, you have very specific interests and some of them align with the other players in the game, but some of them don't too. So you have to develop your own voice really. And one of the ways of developing your own voice is to get really clued up about things. Um, so uh, this is a nice guy called Dr. Ambedkar who was involved in uh, basically decolonializing India. And this was his famous phrase that's been taken up in all sorts of different campaigns. This is what I guess we all have to do and what you have to do as well as a young community is that you've got to educate people about what the issues are. And by agitating, I don't necessarily mean you need to be on the street demonstrating, but you need to be stirring things up a bit, making sure you're asking the right question, speaking truth to power. You've got to get yourselves organized as a group as well. Um, if you're looking for a really good playbook, I've got the best playbook, which I read on holiday a couple of years back. Um, it's called How to Survive a Plague, and it's by a journalist called David France. And it's a fantastic story about how patient groups and scientists got together and worked together um, to really make a massive difference to HIV and to work to really overcome the barriers in all sorts of areas to people getting access to HIV drugs. And largely that's been a real success. So I'd recommend this book to anybody really, just read it through. It's not exactly a parallel, but it's a really good place to start from. And then I'm just gonna stop by just having a slide from Nancy Wexler. I know that people were talking about her earlier on this evening. Um, she wrote a lovely um, editorial when the, when the IONIS trial was published in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years back, or about a year and a half back. And, she, and in that she said, the ultimate challenge will be to bring safe, effective and affordable treatment, not only patients in North America and Europe, but also patients with Huntington's disease throughout the world. And she said, for those in Venezuela who donated the samples that made this promising approach possible, she's talking about anti-sense oligonucleotides, the treatment should be free. So I think, um, we, I feel like we have to honor, honor Nancy and um, fight for those ideals. So at that point, I'm gonna stop talking and I'm really happy to take questions if people wanna ask them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um... You know, one one question that came to mind was regarding, you know, I know you, you, you made an estimate for the Roche uh, drug. Yeah, I'll um, probably get in trouble for that. Uh, uh, well, I guess like, you know, when it comes to, that's just one option, right? And there's also potential yeah. options for gene therapy. Absolutely. You know, that's so, and that's going to probably, so the price will vary depending on, how often it's taken is that right too would you say well i'm sure that's the case yeah yeah how often it's taken um and how effective it is i mean i guess if it's not taken very often it's going to be really expensive but only as a one-off mm -hmm. and um, when you say like also getting our voices heard and involved right like who is it that we need to that needs to hear us is it specifically these companies or and I, I'm assuming yes, but I'm also saying like, who else is it? Like, well, I guess uh, people and the members of like Congress or who are play these political figures, right? I think that's, I think decision makers, who makes the decision? Who, who makes a decision about um, how, who pays for therapies to be given in hospitals and in health systems? And in different places of the world, that might be different. That might be 
politicians or or um, associated groups to politicians like health service groups or health insurance companies or people who are negotiating prices um, but also I guess uh, uh, associations as well so patient support associations because they're I guess they're having to change a little bit now because many patient support organizations have really been up until now largely involved either with providing care services or funding research and actually now they probably have to alter a little bit to become more campaigning organizations or lobbying organizations that really understand this so I guess members of those organizations have got to work with those organizations to facilitate the change in them. But I think yeah. your first job is to get to understand the issues as a group and start organizing as a group so that you understand what the issues are and who the big players are. Yeah. And that might yeah. vary from place to place, but get talking yeah, it, about it. It's going to vary depending on where you live. But um, I know you mentioned it to me before, you know, we went live, but maybe for those in the audience, like, what's the suggested model of like another health community? Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, there are two or three, I think. Spinal muscular atrophy is the one, I think, who's very, as an organization, as a patient sports organization, they're a little bit smaller than us, but quite similar. And it's mainly really young people and children that are affected, uh, but they have a drug that is of a rather similar family to the sorts of drugs we're trying in HD, but it got through its phase three trial much earlier and much quicker and was shown to be moderately effective. And so they had to get onto that really quickly because the drug got licensed fairly quickly. And then it turned out certain people had access to it and certain people didn't. And some subgroups had access to it, but not others. And so that's, although it's great that they have a treatment, it's caused quite a lot of sort of chaos and difficulty that some people have been able to uh, get hold of it and other people haven't but it, they got taken by surprise I think because the drug got licensed much quicker than they were expecting mm. but we've got a little bit of time I suppose that's what I'm saying to you we've got a little time not a yeah. lot of time to get organized before we get hit like that you know oh. it'd be great if we were hit like that I'd love it yeah if the drug if the phase the first phase three trial turned out to be great you know, I'd love that to happen, but, you know, we should prepare for the eventuality of a drug being licensed, which may, we don't know exactly how effective it will be, effective it will be, but I think there's a good chance a drug will be licensed before very long. Mm -hmm. well, that's good. Um, another question from the audience is, what is your opinion on uh, patient support programs developed by Pharma, by, <laughs> by Pharma? uh that enable individuals to access these high cost drugs and are there kind of pros and cons of those programs okay i don't really know that much about those things um so you're saying there are patient support programs where a pharma company will pay for a patient to have a drug yeah so so there's like these patient support pr programs that these pharma biotech companies will enable when the cost of drugs are, are high and it helps kind of, it's kind of like a financial assistance type program. Um, okay. So why so, would a company, why would a company do that? Probably to make sure people get on their medication. Okay. Well, I guess, but I think it sounds like it's more of a U.S. and maybe Canada, okay. or maybe North America thing. Um, okay. I mean, you know, pharma companies, they aren't, they aren't the enemy at all. They're, you know, thank goodness we have them because they develop drugs, but yeah. you know, they have other competing priorities as well. So it's we don't share the identical agendas. So I think we have to work in tandem with pharma companies, but we also have to be careful and quite boundaried about where our interests converge and where they diverge. And I think the important thing is that we're really clear about those things mm -hmm. and we understand you know if a company's offering access they're not charities if they're offering access and subsidizing things there's probably a good reason for that a good business reason which is fine um, but i just think we are we owe it to ourselves to be absolutely honest about what's happening 
and to really understand what's going on. So I guess wising up about what it means. Yeah, they said like momentum, for example, that funds the hep C drug, Harvoni in Canada. Um, yeah. So I guess it might be that companies might subsidize their drug initially to make sure people get on that product before yeah, a new one comes along. I mean, at the end of the day, right? Uh, if no one's taking their drug, they're and then what's the point of it, right? <laughs> like if they no might. one can afford it, if no one can afford mm -hmm. it, then it might be, I don't know, I'm only guessing. It might yeah, be a way of yeah. getting people onto their product before another product comes along. But then I yeah. suppose that's why you've got to be, as a community, you've got to be really wised up because that might be a great idea or it might be a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. So you've yeah. got to you've got to know what you're doing. If somebody's offering you a free treatment, then of course it would be tempting to take it, but you've got to know what you're getting into. Yeah, like long-term. Like, is it yeah. always going? Because that's actually a good point, right? Is it always going to be this set cost or is this only a temporary thing? It's kind of like, a, I feel like with a car, right? Or, or a, when you're renting, yeah. when you're renting a, a place to live versus yeah, it's like my mobile phone contract. They say you've got to have yeah. it for 10, 10 pounds a month for the first six months and then it goes back and then it up. Goes up. Yep. It's like the sale. I yeah. don't know. I mean, I guess there's, I mean, I guess. These people, I don't, this is not a criticism, but these companies yeah. are companies. They exist to be companies and to make profit and thank God for them. Mm -hmm. But that means that there are undoubtedly going to be conflicts of interest. Of course. No, that definitely makes sense. But we just got to under, that's my message to the community is really understand that, get to grips with it, mm -hmm. understand what it's about and engage in it in an honest and forthright way. Yeah. Um, Last thing, and then I want to be mindful, like, is heated a global project? Well, I mean, the first thing to say is heated is more of an idea than anything else. It's an idea and a set of discussions. We don't have a big heated office. Uh, we don't have any staff. It's basically me in my grown up daughter's bedroom as an office in the pandemic. This is heated. So I'd, I'd hate people to go away and think heated is some sort of massive global thing. It's more like an idea. Um, but of course, to me, I, I think, well, I'm not happy until anyone who could potentially benefit from therapies gets access to them. And so it's, an, of course, it's a global project, but it's as, only as good as the people who are doing things. So if people say, you know, heated is, it's you as well now, now you know about it, you're heated too. If that makes any sense. It does, it does. We're, Let, all, we're all heated. Yeah. If anyone wants to get a hold of you to learn more though about this, is there- uh, They can uh, just email me, it's no email. problem. I'm, I have a very easy email to find. What's your email? It's my first name dot my second name at nhs.net. Okay, awesome. Really easy. And you can find it on Google, I'm told pretty easily <laughs> sounds so, good um, so i just i say it's only as heated as an idea it's just about the youth it's about the community getting together and having your own ideas you don't need any sort of sanction from me or any permission from anyone just get together yourselves and start wising up mm -hmm. oh that's good rally the troops yeah, um well basically thanks. that's yeah that's the deal thanks you appreciate it it's an absolute um, pleasure. And everyone go check out. I think we're just closing it up. Um, I wish I was with you. I know. I, I wish we're all together one day, soon enough. I so, like that too. But uh, everyone stay safe out there and uh, see you all soon. Yeah. Okay. See you all. all right. Take care. Bye.